I got up here <clears throat> in the first service and looked up, and I, I was, it's kind of shocking to see see so many people uh, out there after preaching to a camera for 11 weeks. It's been 11 weeks uh, since we have uh, gathered in any way. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the beginning of what promises to be a long road back uh, to some level of normalcy, probably a new normal. That's a phrase that has been used repeatedly during this uh, crisis because things will doubtless uh, change, but we, we hope to see the day sooner than later when uh, our entire congregation is back and there is reasonable safety to sit next to each other and to uh, have a full service again. But until that time, we'll continually, hopefully, gradually build up and build up and, uh, and minister to the entire body uh, at different times, uh, but also uh, through, the, uh, through the live streaming and through the many other ministries that will be hopefully uh, getting back online as time uh, goes by. This is obviously, there's no manual for this. It's, uh, it's a difficult time uh, for us. And uh, I think back to March, what was it, 8th? March 8th, the last time we had a normal service and uh, to, to think of all the people that were here that day uh, <clears throat> and uh, to realize that we've been empty for 11 weeks and now we, we begin to come back. So this is kind of a reopening. We are reopening today and so I thought it would be good to preach a short series of messages under the title of reopening because <clears throat> there are many things connected with this reopening that we will have to navigate. And uh, I'm convinced that the scriptures give insight to every aspect of life. When I think of what we might need most at this moment as a church, I, I think of Romans chapter 14, verse 1, through Romans chapter 15, verse 7. And that's the passage that we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, we're going to begin looking at it for the next several weeks. I'm not done with my series on uh, in times like these, but uh, I hope uh, to, uh, to preach a timely series of messages here and then pick up uh, with a few messages that we have left in, in our previous series. I'm not sure but that the nation that we live in today has been as divided as we are currently, probably since the Vietnam War demonstrations of the 60s. I lived through those times. They were tumultuous times. Uh, when we think of the students at Kent State being shot by National Guardsmen, four of them, uh, those types of events just accosted our sensibilities and I was, I was young at that time. I was 13, 14 years of age, not having much life experience whatsoever. And I kind of grew up thinking, well, I guess this is normal. This is adult life, that, that we're all, you know, this is what society is like. It's, it's divided. It's divisive. It's, it's like this. And then we went on to Watergate and the division with Watergate and the up you know, and the assassinations that went on uh, in uh, the 60s and just, just an incredible, tumultuous time, a divided time. And then there was a period there where uh, there was less division. It, it, it kind of settled down. But in the last 10, 20, 25 years, this... This growing division um, in our society continues to manifest itself socially, politically, economically, religiously. Uh, in every way, we just seem to be a schematic, schism-laden country and people. And then to have happened what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis and all that has happened since then, coupled together with this pandemic, and, and it's just like our society's a tinderbox. 
All of this division has just been building up and building up and building up and, and now it's, it, it seems to be reaching a boiling point and these are, these are difficult, difficult times. But my primary concern and our primary concern as Christians needs to be the church, the kingdom of God and the work of God on earth. But the trouble is, societal divisions always seem to find a way into the church. So even as we see our society out there divided, those things begin to creep in to the church to pit brother against brother and sister against sister. You know what? God anticipated that. And he gave us some instruction concerning that in these chapters that we're going to be looking at. You know, there's a little ditty that goes like this. Believe as I believe, no more, no less, that I am right and no one else confess. Feel as I feel, think only as I think, eat what I eat and drink what I drink. Look as I do, do always as I do, then and only then. Will I fellowship with you? You know, Christians have often gathered themselves around the boundaries of their fellowship by means of what could be called opinion or preference, gray areas or non-essentials. Dave Jasper's a friend of mine with whom I went to school, <clears throat> he became a pastor and then he became an evangelist and for a, a long while there he was traveling across the country and I remember him saying one time that he was driving down uh, a country road in Indiana and uh, there was a crossroads uh, that uh, he came upon and on each corner of that crossroads was a little church, just four different little churches. And he thought that was so odd, and he stopped, and he took a look at that, and he, he re-examined uh, what was going on there. And as he, as he did, he noticed that outside the church, in one church, there were buggies that were completely black. And then on the next corner, the, the buggies behind the, the, the church had some color on them, little color accents on them. And then on another corner were, were buggies with, you know, the, the triangle reflector sign and some other chrome, uh, you know, and stuff, a little gussied up a little bit more. And then on the other corner was a church where there were actually automobiles that were parked outside the building. And it became quite apparent, very very easily and readily that these four churches had divided and reorganized, as it were, around their preference on transportation. Now, we may smile at this, but there are large swaths of Christians who determine orthodoxy and thus their church community based in non-essentials. There are those today who draw their lines in terms of what music to use in the church or, or any music at all. You know, there are two branches of the church of God. There's one branch that uses instruments in worship and, and the other who refuses to use in instruments in worship. I went to the internet this week and did a little study on uh, the Church of God and I actually read an article by a proponent of not using musical instruments. And it wasn't weird. It wasn't, it wasn't crazy. I, I didn't agree with it, but, but he was making an argument as best he could from, from Scripture. But this, the Church of God has decided to split over this. You, if you use instruments, you're over here. If you don't use instruments, you only sing, then you're over here. There are those who have made a specific translation of the Bible, the test of fellowship. This would be the King James Version only movement. There, I've seen a pulpit at a King James only church that had a crest on the wooden pulpit kind of carved in it, and it said, KJB 1611, not KJV, 
because the King James is not a version of the Bible, it is the Bible, okay? So it's very obvious. They, they've emblazoned it on their pulpit that we are gathering around, we are fellowshipping, we are determining orthodoxy based on a translation of the Scripture. Then there are those who have made fellowship a matter of a particular subculture. In other words, their group has constructed any number of preferences and, and opinions and gray areas and, and elevated them to the point of determining orthodoxy and legitimacy around those issues rather than the gospel. And they have allowed their particular iteration of Christianity to determine with whom to fellowship. The independent fundamental Baptist movement of the 20th century determined fellowship by a number of issues centering on dress and music tastes and dancing and movie theater attendance and hairstyles and use of, even use of projection like this in, in a service. Some denominations have gathered around perhaps, uh, prohibiting uh, women uh, from wearing uh, makeup, and men for that matter, but, but wearing of jewelry or head coverings and women and men sitting on different sides of the, of the auditorium during worship time. And lest you think I'm just picking, you know, on, on uh, you know, wackos, okay, you say, Terry, these are extreme, you know, it, just, just so you know, even the Puritans had a heated debate over whether or not to wear wedding rings. This has been, folks, this has been in the church forever. This has been going on since there's been a church. And Paul deals with this. Paul shows us how to navigate these things. While all churches and Christians are different and don't share all the same disputable issues, few are without them at some level. But what may surprise you is that God has designed, God has designed the church in such a way that there will always be disputable matters that can become points of contention and disunity. And the only way to maintain unity in the body is to practice deference in disputable matters as is outlined in the passage that we have chosen here. Now the end result of the mishandling of disputable matters has been an unnecessary fracture of the body of Christ in the world. Confusion among believers and an occasion for unbelievers to blaspheme. And this is not just on the denominational level now. This is at the local church level as well. The same strife and fracturing often occurs in individual churches. What are some of these issues? Well, we may, we may look at them and, and think, that, that, is that really an issue? Like, for instance, is it appropriate to celebrate Christmas? You know, it has pagan roots. Many of the things that we do at Christmas time find pagan uh, origins. Uh, and as we've assimilated some of that stuff. So there are those who absolutely, Christians who will not recognize or, or celebrate Christmas in any way. My uh, pastor friend uh, had a, a person in his uh, church who came in, member of the church who came in, and they had put up a Christmas tree. It was Christmas time. And uh, she said, Pastor, I won't be, uh, I won't be coming uh, to church during the Christmas season. He said, well, why not? And she quoted Jeremiah chapter 10. For the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. And when the pastor indicated that, look, this is, this is talking about 
idolatry? She says, yes, that's right. And that's what we do when we bring our gifts and we kneel down before that tree and we put the gifts under uh, the tree. We had uh, people who visited here last November, a couple, probably in their 50s. And they sought me out after the service and and it was like, uh, Pastor, uh, we are just so enamored with uh, the church and the friendliness and the worship and the preaching. We've, we've found our church. I don't know how many times I've heard that from people uh, who come the first time, and then they never come again. And uh, uh, so they wanted to talk to me, and I brought them into my office, and they said, now, now, we really, we really are, uh, we really like the church, and we are going to be back in January, but we won't be coming during the Christmas season because we, we noticed in your bulletin that you were going to be decorating your tree next week, you know, as a church and stuff like that, and so, and so we, we don't do that, we don't recognize that, but we'll be back in, in January. Well, they never did come back, uh, but... Uh, but at the same point, I did not ridicule them. I did not say, I did not argue with them. I did not say, you know, you, you, have you ever thought of this? And, and I didn't take them to Romans chapter 14 and 15 and all of that. So I just said, I understand. I understand your position. And uh, so that happens. People, people have those positions. There are those who are dead set against any involvement in the social custom of Halloween, and while there are others that have no compunction whatsoever about it. But these are not the only issues. Some Christians have a position against using alcohol at all, even in moderation. Should we attend, for instance, religious ceremonies of family members that promote false doctrine, like, like baptismal uh, regeneration services, or, or should we, should we uh, attend a, 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 a relative's service when they belong to an apostate organization like uh, Mormonism, or, or should we go to a Muslim rite or something like that? Should believers ever go to Las Vegas? Should believers ever send their children to public schools to be educated in that system? Should Christians mow the yard on Sunday afternoon? Should Christians get tattoos? Should Christians dress in a specific way when they come to church? Should Christians use birth control methods to limit family size? And if, as if the church did not have enough disputable matters with which to contend, along comes the coronavirus and COVID-19 with the public shutdown that has followed. Along comes this disruption in our society in the past week uh, and the rioting and the protesting and all that is going on. As if we did not have enough things in the church over which to disagree. And you know, while there was not a lot of disagreements with what to do initially when the pandemic hit, as the pandemic has gone on, we have all formulated our particular views on what is best. We, have all, we all have our, our favorite experts to which we can appeal to support our conclusions. There are those who will tell you exactly why we should wear masks in public and can, report, can point to all the reports and all the data on that. And then there are those who can tell you exactly why we shouldn't wear masks in public and match you article for article and data for data. And then the question of reopening churches creates about as many opinions as you have people. When should we reopen? How should we do it? What regulations should we institute? Then there is the debate as to whether or not the government has the right at all to tell churches that they cannot meet. It seems everyone has developed an opinion. We never thought of these things before, but everyone now has developed an opinion, a, a recommendation, a perspective. Well, in Paul's day, the church at Rome had two issues that characterized this problem. Special days and special diets. And God uses these two issues in Rome 
2,000 years ago to craft a template for these issues and others like them in the church for all time. There were those in the church at Rome who observed particular days as being holy and sacrosanct while others did not. There were those who were practicing dietary restrictions and others who were not following such restrictions. These were things that were causing division in the church at that time. They may seem trifling to us, but I assure you they were of great importance to them. By the way, let me say this. What seems trifling to you, almost to the point of being ridiculous, is held with all gravity and sense of Christian fealty by others. Look at what Paul says in verse 3 of chapter 14. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Paul would warn us not to belittle, not to ridicule, not to ostracize, not to reject those who do not share our opinions in these things. In these things, perception is reality. Paul recognizes this when he says in verse 6 that both sides of the issue believe they are honoring the Lord. Those who eat believe they're honoring the Lord, and those who abstain believe they're honoring the Lord. And in verse 14, Paul is clear that his position was that no food is unclean, but to those who think it is unclean, it is unclean. Perception is reality in these things. So Paul is going to teach us how, how we're supposed to navigate these waters where differences of opinion and practice are present in the church. But for today, this message is going to be a bit different than usual. Before we dive into the text, I'd like to share some remarks in the form of three introductory insights about the passage that will set the table for us to understand Paul's teaching herein. First, we need to understand who the weak are. Notice verse 1. As for the one who is weak in the faith... Welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. We who, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Now, it seems condescending. It seems demeaning. For Paul to speak of, quote, the weak in this passage. However, there can be no doubt that the weak are those who do not appreciate or have not been able to embrace fully their Christian liberty. But the fact of the matter is this. We are all at some point the weak who have not understood our Christian liberty aright. Some of us have been bound where we should not bind ourselves, thus not appreciating the liberty we have in Christ. But others have been loosed in areas where they should not have loosed themselves, showing too that they have misunderstood Christian liberty to mean license, or even worse, disregard for others who hold a different view than you have. You don't understand your Christian liberty if you do that. You don't understand the dynamic of Christian liberty. So virtually all of us at one time or another has been the weaker brother. Not understanding Paul's teaching of Christian liberty. But who particularly were these weaker brothers? The ones that Paul is talking about in this passage. Well, there are four major views that have surfaced. And the first view is that they were ex-idolaters recently converted from paganism. Well, this would make them 
comparable to those in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where Paul is talking about meat sacrificed to idols and the, and the, uh, the reluctance that some Christians were having eating this meat that at one time was sacrificed to, to idols. The two passages have much in common, eating or abstaining, liberty in Christ, weaker brothers, and not causing one to stumble. So there's a real commensurate uh, content. But nowhere in our passage this morning does Paul mention meat offered to idols. And there's no hint of the fear of idolatry, that, that the fear of idolatry was the gist of the discussion here. So we would have to conclude that while there were similarities, the situations in Rome and in Corinth were, were different. A second view is that these were ascetics. Asceticism was the practice of self-denial and harsh discipline of the body in order to affect spiritual advancement in one's life. Asceticism was widespread in antiquity, even among Jewish sects. Evidence for these being ascetics is found by some in verse 21 of chapter 14, where drinking wine is all of a sudden added to the list, while up to this point, days and diets has been the sole focus. But that's pretty thin. And beyond this, any other evidence is missing that Paul was addressing ascetics at this point. The third view is that these were legalists in the strictest sense. This view supposes that Weak in the faith, in verse 1, indicates those who did not grasp the fundamental principles of the gospel, the fundamental principle of justification by faith. And they were attempting, by maintaining days and diets, to, to procure their justification as a means of justification. But certainly, Paul would have not been so conciliatory in this passage if that were the case. If these were corrupting the gospel, if Paul was addressing people that were corrupting the gospel, he would not have been so conciliatory. He would have condemned them as he does in Galatians chapter 1. And so there's a preferred view that I think presents itself that these were for the most part Jewish Christians, those who had come to Christ from Judaism, and their weakness was constituted in believing that they had to maintain certain Jewish diets and special days if they were going to, if they were going to please the Lord. In terms of diets, they would eat only clean foods. Verse 14, verse 20, talking about clean foods and unclean foods. Perhaps they abstained because they could not procure kosher foods, including foods that were slaughtered uh, in the prescribed way. In terms of days, they would have revered the Sabbath and Jewish festivals. So Paul has a conciliatory attitude toward them that would lend itself to this idea, much like the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15 that, that, that dealt with the issue of, of circumcision and, and put that to rest. You did not need to be circumcised to be, to be saved. You did not have to keep that in order to be a Christian. But at the same time, writing to the Jewish converts and saying it was, it, was, it was legitimate for them to maintain certain sensibilities that they would have concerning their Jewishness and that Gentiles uh, should, uh, should give space for that. That seems to be, that seems to be the, uh, uh, the, the flavor here in Romans chapter 14. Well, there, there are weak today any time we hold to a non-essential as being essential. Now let me say this. There is nothing wrong with holding to a non-essential. As long as we recognize they are non-essential. And our holding to them does not harm my brother or my sister in 
Christ. Well, here's a second introductory insight. We need to understand the nature of these disputable matters. What is the nature of these disputable matters? Verse 14. Well, the fact that Paul does not demand conformity in any of these areas is telling, I think. What this shows us is that these issues were not about sin. Paul was not talking about issues of morality or even ethical failure. The, these, these words, uh, the, the words used to translate this Greek term here in verse 1, sometimes it's translated doubtful disputations as in the King James Version or disputable matters in the NIV, uh, opinions in the RSV and in our ESV here, about which Christians were not commanded to agree. They were instead given latitude to observe or not observe as, as their conscience led them. This should present no problem. Everyone has liberty to observe or not observe. However, two problems Two problems can arise. First of all, when many are convinced of the righteousness of their opinion or disputable matter and then begin to accuse those or look askance at those who do not agree with them, thinking that perhaps they're just not as insightful, they're not as spiritual as I am because they don't hold to my non-essential. And then the second problem is when a believer idolizes his liberty. He understands his Christian liberty, that he's got latitude here in these things, but he idolizes that liberty and that right to exercise that liberty, no matter how it might affect others or the church at large. These are the two potential pitfalls. There are Christians that feel that using Birth control, you're sinning. Sometimes even charging those who use birth control with abortion practices. This is wrong. Others actually believe you're sinning if you don't practice birth control because God has made us stewards of the earth and excessive population is poor stewardship, especially if you cannot support a larger sized family. And they look down on those with bigger families. This too is wrong. We will be guilty of creating unnecessary and harmful division in the body of Christ if we do not recognize these things as legitimately disputable matters and not areas of right and wrong. And you know what we get then? If we don't, if we're not careful, we get a church where this is over here, that's, that's, the, that's the no birth control group over here. And then here's the King James group over here. And then here's the, here's the, uh, the group over here that coalesces around, or several different groups that coalesce around what kind of education they give to their children, whether it's a home school or private school or Christian school or public school. And, and those groups begin to identify with each other. And before you know it, you don't have a church anymore united in the gospel. You have a series of separate groups that are stuck together based on their particular non-essential that they hold dear. So we need to recognize that these are not areas of right or wrong that should be used to determine the parameters of our fellowship. But we also need to see that these are not issues of doctrinal purity or orthodoxy. Some have attempted to lump into this discussion issues such as differences in baptismal practices, eschatological differences, church polity, divorce, acceptance or denial of miraculous gifts, and other such secondary doctrines. This is not that. Paul is not talking about these. He is speaking of things that the Bible does not directly address. And the Bible certainly addresses all those secondary issues and we need to wrestle with them and we need to study them and we need to, we need to come to a position on all of those. But let's not be lured into dismissing secondary doctrines as being unimportant. They're very important. 
A third introductory insight would be this. These issues must never become tests of spirituality or acceptability to God. Verse 3. Those who are weak in the faith, verse 1, and remember, we're all weak at some point, are just as scrupulous and just as dedicated to Christ as those who correctly understand and practice their liberty. On the other side, there are those who understand their liberty. Those who understand their liberty are not free and easy party animals who have no sense of right and wrong. They're they're just worldly antinomians. No. The temptation is to paint those who do not share our views on these issues as either hopelessly immature or profoundly licentious. Both extremes are unwarranted. And what can happen is that we can assure ourselves that we are righteous in these non-essential issues and yet fail in the truly essential areas. Years ago, a pastor friend of mine uh, stated that, you know, we we all have different uh, uh, approaches to to entertainment, what we will watch, what we won't watch in our family units and what have you. And uh, back, this is about 20, 25 years ago, back in that day, he (coughs) had made the declaration that my family only watches G-rated movies and programs. And I thought at that time, I thought, wow. Well, that's, wow, that's a, that's a heavy standard, right? That's a real rigorous standard. The, the, this, guy's, this guy's really got some good moral fiber, you know, to him. And he's really, really to be, uh, to be looked up to and, and all of those things. And so they refused to watch anything other than a G movie. And I held him in high esteem because of that until I found out that he was having an affair with his secretary. And so, look, we, we can be so righteous, right, in our non-essential area. We, we, can be, we can be so scrupulous about our particular, you know, things and still, still be morally suspect and failures in so many ways. You see, these non-essential areas in and of themselves say absolutely nothing about our spirituality. They do not speak to our morality. These are not spiritual issues. I know we think they are. Sometimes we are sure they are. We are sure that our position on these things is God's position. And even if it is not, he certainly leans my way on these things. The fact of the matter is, if indeed it is one of these gray areas, if indeed it is a non-essential, a disputable matter, a preference, an opinion, it is a matter of complete indifference to God in terms of its spiritual benefit or harm. He does not care. It is spiritually neutral. God accepts both the one who eats and the one who doesn't eat. Verse 3, these things have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Verse 17, so don't make these things so important that you destroy the work of God because of them. Verse 20, In a related passage we've already mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8, Paul says, food will not commend you to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. Why? Because these are not spiritual issues. They are not leading spiritual indicators. God is totally indifferent about them in terms of spirituality. 
Listen, God is totally indifferent as to the spirituality of when we restart services as a church. God is totally indifferent as to the inherent spirituality of placing a mask over your face or not. Now, what God does care about is how we hold these things. That is what this passage is about. How do we interact and treat our brothers and sisters who hold to these things or who do not hold to them? What is our attitude toward each other? What is our heart toward each other? So as we prepare to study this passage, keep in mind these insights that we can draw from the overall context of the passage. One would be being the weaker brother at any given time is not necessarily a sign of immaturity or lack of spirituality. We will all be the weaker brother at some point. These issues are not about sin, and they're not about secondary doctrines. These issues are totally neutral in terms of spirituality. In other words, they are not... We are not more spiritual if we don't eat, and we are not more spiritual if we do, or not more spiritual if we do. These are things of complete indifference to God, except in how we relate to each other in them. But God, some might ask the question, God, why didn't you just straighten this all out? Why didn't you just give us some very clear teaching about all of this, right? Why didn't you write, when a pandemic hits, here's when and how to reopen a church? Why didn't you write, here's why you should wear a face mask or why you shouldn't, when you should and when you should? God, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you just list every possible thing that we might be able to disagree on in these disputable matters. Why didn't you just settle it all and make it easy? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. One, think of the impracticality of that. Think of how big our Bibles would have to be to anticipate every possible thing that we could possibly disagree on that were non-essential things. And then think of the different cultures that God would have to write about right? Different cultures. And for centuries, we would have no idea what that portion of Scripture is talking about. If if God had written 2,000 years ago, thou shalt not observe Halloween, for for hundreds and hundreds of years, people, Christians would be going, what's Halloween? Right? What what is Halloween? And, And that would have to be true in every culture, in every people throughout the world. So God does not God does not teach us via legislation. He teaches us via principle. And he uses these principles of days and diets to cover all of these issues. So that's one reason. But the other reason is far more important. Having these disputable matters in the church and among believers is an incredible opportunity to display the gospel. You see, the gospel is how God brings together all kinds of different people, all kinds of different views, all kinds of different preferences, all kinds of different music, all kinds of different dress, all kinds of different things that people can attach themselves to in terms of of. Of, of, of an iteration of their Christianity. And the gospel brings all of that under the great umbrella of the gospel and creates unity in the midst of that diversity. Listen, it's not honoring to God to simply, for, for God to just make cookie-cutter Christians. Every single thing about your life is just like, we all have the same music. God didn't say, this is the kind of music that you will listen to and everybody will like this music. God didn't say, this is how everyone will dress. You got to dress just like Terry. Oh my, we'd be in trouble if that happened, right? Uh, 
this, this, is, this, is, this is how you are supposed, this is the entertainment you can watch and can't watch. God did not do that. God said there is diversity in these non-essential areas. And the fact that there is diversity gives us the opportunity to display the power of the gospel. You do not have to become black to be a Christian. You do not have to become white to be a Christian. You do not have to become brown or Latino to become a Christian. All races come under the rubric of the gospel. You, you, didn't, you don't have to have a certain level of education. You don't have to have a certain social status. You don't have to have the same likes in literature or art or any of these things. These preferential, non-essential areas. Bring them into the church. Don't feel like you've got to conform. And this is, this is the problem with, with, with these churches. They gather around these things, and in order for you to come into the church and at least feel comfortable in the church, you've got to adhere to these things. You've got to accept these things. It honors the gospel more. It honors God more to have that diversity held together in unity by the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. That's what the gospel does. And so, it's not my job. Sometimes I've thought it's been my job in the past, but it's not my job. It's not my job as your spiritual leader or one of your spiritual leaders to, to weed out from your life, you know, those types of things, you know, and, and, and to make sure you put into your life the, the kind of non-essential preferential things that I think are best or that even we as elders think are best. It's not our job. And that's not God, what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to have unity because, they're, because we're cookie-cutter Christians and we have no choice but to be unified. But when great unity can come in the midst of diversity and disagreement, that honors God and that shows the power of the gospel. And that's what we have an opportunity to do here in this time and in this day. This day of great division in our society, great turmoil in our society to show that there are enclaves of diverse people who live together in love and unity because of the gospel. This is the gospel that Jesus came into the world to deliver. The perfect man who lived a perfect life to offer a perfect sacrifice to pay for the sins of all who would believe in him. That he is the divine son of God who gave up his life on the cross to pay the penalty of sin. This is the gospel. And that he overcame death in the resurrection that we might have life. And through repentant faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, anyone who bows before him and by faith recognizes him as Lord and Savior will be saved from the wrath of God and the penalty of sin. But as believers now... If never before, now is the time, perhaps more than ever, that you will see if the gospel and your love for your brethren are more important, are more important to you than you are to yourself. It's in times like these that we come to know if we really believe in the power and implications of the gospel or if the gospel is just a platitude to us because if you believe the gospel the gospel impacts the way you live and in this passage the gospel calls us to live selflessly deferentially and lovingly toward those who hold differing views in disputable matters please stand with me and receive if you will this benediction
Lord God Almighty, come among us in power as we depart. Supernaturally conform our hearts to the gospel to love one another in these trying times. To desire more than anything to thereby glorify the Savior and preserve the unity of the Spirit. Dismiss us in the power of the Holy Spirit that binds our hearts together in the most important cause, the greatest cause, the only cause, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We are dismissed.